will have the opportunity to ask both Ali and Guy all the questions that you've ever wished for, from anything from the agreement that the two of them came up with, their campaign priorities, and of course, their visions for the future of Europe. From the last few days as well, we've been gathering some questions on the Aldi Party's Twitter and Facebook page, so we'll be including them as well. I'd like to extend a warm welcome as well to those watching online on the Aldi Party website, aldiparty.eu. But for those here in the room that have the right to vote, bear in mind that straight after this session, you'll have one hour to go straight to the voting booths in foyer three to vote on that resolution that Sir Graham Watson mentioned earlier on the compromise that was made on the 20th of January between the nominees. The agreement assures that both candidates agree to campaign vigorously together. And straight after this questions and answer, of course, you'll have to vote to either adopt it, not to adopt, or to abstain. So we've one question there. Hello. Well, it's interesting to be the first question. My name is Guadaloma Naita. I'm the vice president of the European Youth Forum. Thank you very much, Mr. Oli Ren and Mr. Guy Verhofstadt for your inspiring speeches today. We all know that young people across Europe are facing different challenges, not only employment, education, could be participation in civil society, mobility issues. The Youth Forum has a set of suggestions for the candidates for the European Parliament, and I encourage also you to look at them and hopefully support them and everyone else to come to us and also to hear what the young people of Europe have to say. But what I'd like to hear is what is your answer towards the challenges that young people are facing? Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your question. We'll take one more question and then we'll take an answer from both Guy and Ali. Yes, I'm Rudi Rentschler from the new German FDP. You're welcome. Uh, <clears throat> I was impressed and um, now building a pol uh, political union in Europe the both candidates, what would you think, what are the chances to get a uniform electoral law in Europe in the next five, eight or ten years? And what could you do or the Liberals do in order to go, order to go in this way and to start to build really a political union? Thank you very much for your question. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Ali Ren. Thank you. Thank you for these, uh, these questions. Uh, I start with uh, the one raised by the Vice President of uh, the European Youth Forum. I feel, uh, in fact, uh, plenty of uh, sympathy for your work uh, because uh, I used to be chairing the Finnish Youth uh, Council only some uh, decades ago, maybe. And uh, we used to brag that uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, seven million members, uh, which is pretty good for uh, a country of uh, five million people because we had uh, 55 uh, member organizations, uh, out of which the Church of Finland, uh, 4 million, and uh, the Confederation of Trade Unions, uh, 1 million, and uh, the other 53, the rest. Uh, so that makes uh, 7 million in a country of uh, 5 million people. More seriously, your question is extremely important, and uh, I believe that uh, the top priority for young people in Europe uh, is uh, today to have a job. Uh, and uh, that's why we have to do everything it uh, takes uh, in order to strengthen the economic recovery and thus uh, enable us uh, to create uh, jobs uh, in Europe, uh, especially for young people. In that context, it's also important that uh, we work uh, further for labor mobility because uh, many young people want to have the preconditions uh, also to seek for work uh, elsewhere in Europe. We have done a lot on that, uh, but uh, we still have to continue to have this uh, as a major, major uh, priority. And uh, I believe that uh, as part of this, uh, it's very important that uh, the European Union enables uh, young Europeans uh, to study and uh, work uh, abroad. And I believe that uh, the Erasmus program has been one of the great success stories uh, of uh, Europe uh, in the past uh, two decades. I remember at the University of Helsinki 20 years ago, we started uh, the program. The older professors were not very keen beca because it uh, meant that uh, they would have had more work, uh, but the students uh, and uh, assistant professors uh, voted with their feet uh, and uh, created because there was such a demand uh, for this uh, Erasmus uh, program. 
In the next years, uh, we will have uh, two million Europeans uh, studying or working abroad uh, thanks to the Erasmus program, which has, uh, has received 40% uh, uh, more funding in the next uh, seven-year period uh, in uh, Europe. So jobs, uh, labor mobility, and uh, at the same time, uh, the importance uh, to facilitate uh, student exchange uh, and uh, working abroad uh, in, in Europe. Concerning your question on the electoral law, universal electoral law, I believe that uh, this could be well subject uh, to uh, discussions uh, in case uh, we will go for a treaty change uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, as you may recall that uh, in our electoral manifesto, the London, London electoral manifesto, we are raising the option of uh, possibly calling for a convention during the next uh, parliamentary mandate. Well, we all know that uh, treaty change in Europe is uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, as Guy, I'm a functionalist. Uh, I believe that uh, form follows uh, function. And uh, we have to carefully think uh, what kind of uh, institutional reforms uh, we should uh, perhaps uh, do in the coming years. Uh, having said that, uh, I believe that uh, the first and foremost priority in Europe is uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation. And uh, we cannot uh, lose too much time uh, in uh, institutional wrangling. We have to focus on uh, concrete, uh, tangible issues uh, that matter really for the ordinary people. Thank you. Sim simply to add uh, one or two uh, elements to the, uh, uh, the, the answers uh, that have been given by Oli. First of all, uh, for young people, I think that we cannot uh, tell to young people, oh, look, uh, you have to like uh, Europe because we got uh, 60 years of peace in Europe. That's true, and that's an enormous achievement, but that's not an argument that it's enough for young people. People that uh, don't have know the war, don't know what in fact peace is. We need really to give them the possibility to build up their own life, to have a job in Europe. And there are two main things, as have been indicated by Oli. The first is labor mobility. There are 14, 14 million vacancies for the moment in Europe. The labor mobility, dear friends, is only 2.8% in Europe. In the US, it's more than 10%. And that means, in fact, very concretely, that uh, because of this lack of labor mobility, young people who can have a job in another country, in another region, don't have it for the moment. And there is a huge battle about the principle of labor mobility. In Britain, a number of uh, Eurosceptics try to make it as the, as the main problem, saying, yeah, when the borders are open, when Schengen is open, we shall see 29 million of Bulgarians and Romanians coming in. The same story that they told, you remember, when Spain came in uh, the Union and when uh, uh, the Polish plumber, this story was told a few years ago. Well, I, I asked from some data, uh, and it seems more 29 Bulgarians and Romanians who came in since the 1st of uh, January, and not 29 million of Bulgarians and Romanians. But it is used, used uh, by anti-Europeans uh, to say no to the European Union. And the second thing what we need is not only more labor mobility, but also to lower the cost of interest rates for investments, for starting investments by young, small, medium-sized companies. Today, there is enough money in the banks, but for yeah, a young investor who wants to try to start his business, he has to pay interest rates or five, or six, or seven, or eight percent. Not sustainable. So we need to have one capital market in Europe, a lowering of interest rates, the money from the banks coming in the real economy to can and to create these jobs for young people. And then on the issue, naturally, of uh, unified electoral law, well, it's clear it's Andrew Duff who shall realize that in the next five years. Eh? Andrew is always busy uh, with electoral law, but I think that we make a step forward for the moment. That is that we have a common candidate for every of the big political parties in Europe. That never happened. So for the first time, I'm confident, I think we shall see European elections about European items. Not what we got every time. Let's be honest. What was European elections? It was a test for a national government. It was about national issues, never about European issues. Well, I'm confident that with this system and 
with these common candidates for the first time, we shall see everywhere in Europe huge debates between conservatives, socialists, liberals and eurosceptics about their vision for the future. Thank you very much. Um, so four questions from the audience. I can't really see you, so like before, if you can just sign up, we have another one here, yeah? Go for it. Good afternoon. My name is Olena Pristaikan, and I'm uh, advisor to Ukrainian uh, Liberal Party, All Ukraine. I welcome everybody from Ukraine here, which was mentioned several times already. And I have a question, no, I will start first with the thank words for the Aldi party and for Aldi family for your firm support uh, of the Ukrainians who are fighting now on the streets for the freedom and for the European values. This is incredible. And thank you, yes. And my question wouldn't be original, but very serious and mostly discussed in Kiev. What EU, what member states can do to help us? And my question is, I direct to Mr. Gier and Ole. What would you, or maybe you already envisaged the steps in the short term when this crisis is so sharp and on the long term or mid term prospects in order to support Ukraine in its European inspiration, but foremostly for the moment, what can Alde Group and Europe and EU itself can do to, to stop the violence, to help us to defeat this, let's say, non-democratic government? Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your question. Ali, would you like to start? Thank you very much for your question and, uh, and uh, for your words uh, and uh, welcome among the Liberals uh, here in Europe. Uh, you are more than welcome and uh, you have uh, all our support and uh, sympathy for fighting for democratic uh, values, in uh, European values in, in uh, Ukraine. I believe that uh, in the short term uh, the only way is uh, a political solution and uh, any kind of uh, violence uh, is uh, not acceptable, it has to be condemned uh, very clearly and uh, that's why the European Union is uh, making efforts uh, in order to mediate uh, in the current uh, conflict. At the same time uh, it's important that uh, in the medium to long term uh, once uh, we solve this immediate situation, once uh, there is uh, a lasting political, political way forward uh, on the basis of uh, democratic values uh, respecting uh, human rights uh, then uh, we can move forward uh, and uh, then the European Union needs to provide uh, more economic uh, and financial support uh, for Ukraine and for the Ukrainian people. We are ready for doing that, uh, but at the same time uh, that calls for serious uh, reforms, uh, economic and political reforms uh, by the government uh, and uh, that's why we have not been able to move yet uh, in this regard. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, we will certainly move uh, with uh, this economic uh, and financial support uh, once uh, the reforms uh, are moving in uh, Ukraine. And you have all our sympathy and support uh, for these objectives. I, I think what we, uh, we have to continue, uh, the, the line we have followed the, the, the last, uh, not weeks, months already, Uri, uh, that we are working on this, that it's to increase pressure to continue to increase pressure on Yanukovych uh, and, and uh, uh, his people, uh, first of all to stop violence and to come back uh, to the agenda. And the agenda where everything started was the refusal, in fact, by him uh, to uh, enter in an, uh, an association agreement with the European Union. And I think that uh, we need a number of things to add to this. First of all, we have to look if uh, when we are there, when we have these contacts, we cannot upgrade that association agreement so that this uh, agreement becomes, uh, becomes more important and can be a real, how to say, game changer towards the, the, the willingness of some people in Ukraine yeah, to go for a Russian future because that is what is at stake. It's a, it's a, it's a choice to make. 
uh, by Ukraine, and the people of Ukraine knows what choice to make, but the leadership between brackets don't do it for the moment. So an upgraded association agreement can be one of the elements, as also the recognition by the European Union of those structures that the opposition is putting in place, because that shall happen in the coming weeks and the coming months. And only then, I agree with Hans, Hans van Baal, who was there a few uh, days ago. They let him go again. Thank you, Hans. And uh, he said, it's not time for sanctions now, but we have to be prepared on this, if it is necessary. And if Yanukovych is continuing his way of thinking and his way of handling. Thank you very much. We'll take the next question from that lady. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Ruth Coleman-Taylor. I'm from the UK Liberal Democrats. And from my gender and my age, I represent the people who vote. I also represent the majority of voters and the majority of members of our parties, because I am a woman. Now, I cannot criticize you gentlemen for being men. And thank you very much for all the very positive things that you have said. But there is a problem that Although women are interested in politics, they find politics very difficult because the working hours involved, either as an activist or as an elected member, are not compatible with working life and family life. That the kind of political dialogue that takes place in many countries is offensive, is personally hurtful, and does in fact deter people from taking part. I think the Liberals can do better. So I'd like to hear from them, what are you going to do to improve the quality and performance of political life so that next time we are choosing our candidates, there will be at least one woman on the platform yeah. <laughs> as a candidate? Let's go with that question. We'll take, we'll take your thoughts on that. I can no, only agree, I think. Yeah? <laughs> so we take the next question, or no? Let's yeah. stick to the. We can comment this at the same time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Sorry. We'll take. Ah, one by one. <laughs> so I, I mean, uh, I fully agree with you, and uh, and uh, of course uh, it would be great that uh, we would have a better gender balance uh, here on uh, on the podium, but uh, apparently there were no female candidates uh, this time uh, who. Uh, put themselves uh, forward. Uh, I hope that uh, this will happen next time. I have, uh, in fact, uh, devoted a uh, big part of my political activity for gender balance uh, and uh, for the equal participation of uh, women in, in uh, political life. Uh, it comes actually from uh, home because uh, my mother was uh, a political activist. Uh, she became uh, a member of parliament uh, after me, in fact, uh, and uh, she was also leading the female entrepreneurs association in the country I know best. Uh, and uh, I'm very committed uh, to work for gender balance, uh, including supporting the, which is uh, controversial perhaps even among the liberals, uh, supporting the commission proposal of uh, having uh, quotas uh, for both uh, genders, uh, both sexes uh, in uh, corporate uh, governance uh, in Europe. Uh, I believe that uh, there is place for this kind of uh, affirmative action for gender balance uh, and for women's participation in working life uh, and in democratic politics. No, I, I have not to add much. We thought at a certain moment on an operation of one of both of us, but we, we, it was too risky. We didn't do it at, uh, at the end. We tossed, uh, we tossed the coin and Guy lost uh, yeah, so, uh, no. and then I said, it. And then I said, stop, Uli, we don't go in that direction. No, no, no. <laughs> But in any way, the, the question that has been put forward is good for our group in the European Parliament. Because there, we're discussing these items uh, ma ma many times. And I think gender equality and the balance uh, in, in these uh, matters is for me a European issue. It's not true that it's only a question of national legislation. It has to be a framework on the European level so that this gender balance is a basic value, fundamental value in all our countries of the European Union. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. I'll take your question and then a question from this side. Thank you. Janusz Andrzejewicz, 
taken Democratic the Party in Poland. Yeah. I'm so glad that the issue of Ukraine is, is present here. But I would like to push you a little bit further because what Ukrainians need is not to know what European Union is going to do tomorrow. They need a certain perspective and perspective which was given by European Parliament but which was not sort of matched by declarations of European Commission and European and Council of Europe, uh, European Council. Ukrainians need hope and it, it should and it should not be this conviction that their European aspiration is a pipe dream. They need a hope. Let's give them. Okay, thank you for your comment. As a question, I'll take one more question and we come back here for yours. Yeah. Hello, my name is François Xavier Anne, and I'm a member of the French Alternative Coalition. I was just curious, what are the concrete and pragmatic next steps toward a more functional Europe? So we agree on the goal, so how do we proceed in the economy, in the institution, in the external affairs? What are the next steps in your humble opinion? No opinion. For more functional. Thank you for your question. Uh, hello, Paul Reynolds from uh, UK uh, Lib Dems. Um, about a decade ago, a particular member of the European Parliament called Nick Clegg, who is now the Deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, wrote a pamphlet where he argued for the full implementation of the concepts of subsidiarity and for the European Union to do less, but do it better and stronger. And now today we have many parties across the European Union, even the CDU, I think a week or so ago, uh, promoting and setting out the same uh, strategic direction. To what extent uh, do you support this and uh, how much can we expect you to uh, promote this agenda in the future? Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your question. We'll take the next gentleman as well so we can get onto the Twitter and Facebook. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. My name is Niklas Manfolk. I come from the Svenska Folkpartiet in Finland. I'm something of a, of a well, a co candidate of Ollis, I suppose. Um, gentlemen, you both spoke of, of solving social challenges in the European Union. In order to do that, we need money. And that's taxation, ta tax money. Most of that tax money, or at least very large quantities of it, is currently being evaded uh, outside of Europe. Um, please discuss. Thank you. First, uh, as regards uh, the question, or rather comment, uh, concerning Ukraine, I think uh, we both, uh, both can uh, only agree with that uh, we have to provide uh, hope uh, and uh, future perspective uh, for Ukraine. I worked uh, very intensively in the Western Balkans uh, for over five years uh, as uh, enlargement commissioner and uh, if there is uh, one thing I'm happy of uh, is that uh, we were able to provide uh, Serbia and uh, the Serbian people such kind of uh, a European road uh, that they are, in fact, uh, permanently anchored uh, on a European perspective and uh, not drifting away from European values uh, to some uh, more, say, Eastern values uh, of uh, less democracy, less human rights uh, and uh, less uh, peace and uh, stabilization. Today, Serbia is uh, firmly on a European path. Uh, even if there have been changes in the recent uh, elections, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, it is uh, a certain model for how we work with uh, Ukraine, so that uh, we work with uh, patience, uh, we work with uh, strong support, uh, and uh, we provide uh, Ukraine a very clear European perspective. As, as regards uh, the question from uh, our French friend and uh, British friend, uh, in fact, uh, it's excellent. Mm, uh, mm. Franco-British uh, cooperation, because uh, your questions uh, are very much interrelated. Uh, how do we build a functional Europe uh, which also respects uh, subsidiarity? I believe that uh, Europe has to be big in big things uh, and uh, small in small things uh, and uh, often not, uh, not get involved uh, at all. For instance, uh, 
there is no reason why, why we should uh, regulate uh, the diameter of uh, strawberry which can be sold uh, in the marketplace of uh, Mikkeli or of uh, Orekim. That's something that uh, we don't necessarily need any European regulation. But at the same time, it's important that uh, we have strengthened uh, the economic governance of Europe uh, for the sake of uh, stability and uh, sustainable growth. Uh, and within that frame, uh, we give uh, entrepreneurial drive and uh, competitive innovation enough room so that uh, we can create uh, wealth uh, and we can create uh, jobs. As regards uh, Niklas' question, uh, yes, you are right, uh, we need uh, money to tackle social problems. We also need uh, a well-functioning single market. We need uh, more entrepreneurial drive uh, to build up uh, a stronger economy and uh, having less social problems. Uh, but as regards uh, tax evasion, to which you referred to, it is indeed uh, still a serious problem in many countries of Europe. Uh, but we have actually done uh, quite a lot of uh, progress uh, in this regard uh, in the recent years, uh, and we have to now build on that progress uh, so that uh, we work with uh, many countries uh, on the basis of uh, bilateral agreements uh, with Switzerland, for instance, uh, and uh, we have to continue to work uh, at the international arena, arenas uh, like uh, Group 20 and uh, the International Monetary Fund, uh, where we have uh, quite good uh, policy coordination on these issues. Uh, I've had the honor to present our proposals uh, in this uh, fora, and uh, we have been pushing very hard uh, to uh, stop, uh, to fight uh, tax evasion and uh, to ensure that uh, we have uh, a level playing field uh, in the field of uh, taxation in Europe uh, and uh, internationally. So maybe I can take the three questions together and <laughs> one answer. But the, the main point that we have to solve now, and uh, Uli Rehn is also working on this with the Commission and with uh, uh, Barnier, is naturally the banking union. That is the priority before the elections, if possible, of May uh, of this year. Because if we don't have this banking union, confidence between the financial institutions shall not return. And, and the, the main problem of our economic crisis, the fact that the money is not longer transferred from the banks to the real economy shall not be solved. So this banking union is urgent, and I hope that in any way, from the side of the, nation, the, the member states, from the side of the council, they can accept that we go for a real European resolution fund, not funded by taxpayers' money, funded by the banks themselves in accordance to their risk profile to find the solution in the coming weeks and in the coming months. It's crucial for the European economy because we have seen in the past, when we have seen it in Sweden, we have seen it in Japan, only when you deal with your banking problem, you can recover. You can come out of this crisis at a, at a higher speed on the right path. And, and, and secondly, the, the second thing to do, I think, in the coming years, is to have uh, a system of economic governance in union because yeah, we have a euro. Okay, if you have a euro, then you need a common strategy. Then you, you need a, a common attitude. You need a stability and growth pact. You need rules that are applied. And you need also economies that are converging and not diverging. That has been the tragedy the last 10 years. We have got the euro is introduced. We have not the right institutions in place and economies have diverged instead of converged. And in that respect, I'm very much, I'm very critical towards the idea to, to do individual contractual, they call it, arrangements between one member state and the European institutions uh, to define the reforms. In my opinion, they shall create an enormous opposition of huge parts of the population against Europe and against these reforms. What we need is a common framework, convergence framework, where Europe is only defining what I call minimum maximum values, the essential parameters of labor reforms, of pension reforms, but where the national ownerships continue to exist. It's on the national level that they have to decide what type of pension they want in the Netherlands, for example, what type of labor reform they want in another country, but within the parameters that have been decided on the European level. And that especially that I call subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is in fact the art in politics to say, oh, that is on the local level to do. That is on the regional level. That's on the national level. And only when we can have added value, we do it on the supranational 
and the European level. But economic governance is at least one of these policies to do on this economic level, on this European level. Very briefly, Ali, you want to add something? In my view, in fact, uh, what Guy said about uh, economic governance and uh, the banking union are uh, a very good example of uh, liberal influence uh, in the European Union. We have worked very closely together with Guy and uh, the liberal group in the parliament uh, to reinforce uh, economic governance uh, and uh, thus to support uh, economic reforms uh, in the member states uh, in Europe. Now we are doing the same uh, concerning the banking union in order to have uh, a healthy and uh, resilient uh, banking sector in Europe, uh, which is able to do take care of its uh, basic job, uh, which is uh, lending to the real economy, to uh, enterprises, especially SMEs, uh, and uh, to households. And uh, I'm, I trust that uh, we will succeed in this uh, still uh, before the end of the current uh, parliamentary mandate, uh, so that we can further reinforce uh, economic uh, confidence uh, in, uh, in Europe. Great, we'll start with that gentleman there. You can go ahead and then we'll move over here. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear liberal friends and dear candidates. I'm Teppo Sakkinen, president of Finnish Centre Youth and part of the LIMEC delegation here. I have two questions concerning uh, foreign policy and enlargement. Concerning external action, what do you think is the future of European Union external action and what are the successes and failures uh, so far? What is your estimation, particularly in the case of Syria uh, concerning enlargement, uh, I take it from your previous answers that West Balkans is still a priority. Uh, what about Turkey? Did the events of Taksim Square in July affect and should they affect uh, the path to membership of Turkey? Thank you. Thank you very much. And you've been very active on Twitter as well, I've seen. So thank you very much for your questions there. Okay, this gentleman here. Good afternoon, everybody. Massimo Bernacconi. I'm the international officer of Italia dei Valori, which uh, I would like to remember also to Guy is the, so far the only Italian party which is a full member of ALDE. So I would like to see maybe Mr. Mario Monti in the future uh, to be part of our uh, assembly, but uh, for the time being, uh, there is no such uh, a sign, and I the, was the wondering uh, why why uh, is uh, uh, waiting so much uh, to uh, to to in fact uh, ask for uh, for membership uh, since he had the time in the past two years. But that uh, was not the question that uh, I would like to ask. Is uh, is more uh, related on uh, the, the situation in the Mediterranean and uh, on the fact that uh, all the time we have to wait for a tragedy for Europe to move. So some uh, months ago there were many people dying in the Mediterranean. It was a scandal, everybody was crying for the kids, for the mothers, etc. But then nothing moved. So for, to both uh, of you, Guy, as uh, I hope future uh, president of the, the Commission, and uh, uh, to uh, also Oli as uh, maybe uh, the, the um, uh, next, uh, <laughs> let's say, Lady Ashton guy. <laughs> what uh, are, do you intend to do about, about that concretely and not just in terms of uh, principal declaration? Thank you very much and good luck. Hi, good afternoon. Matthias Schloss from uh, Meos, Austria. Uh, I would like to come back to your point, uh, form follows function, uh, all later in. Uh, I'm not quite sure because function matters, and um, I think uh, function also impacts, uh, uh, form also impacts uh, function. So uh, I'm absolutely convinced that we need a convent, and I'm absolutely convinced uh, that we should not waste this good crisis. So, uh, Form is decisive when it comes to a convent. And uh, I would be keen uh, to see a convent that is the most innovative and comprising process uh, democracy has ever seen on this planet. So let's share the experiences from the Atlantic open constitution process from other countries. And uh, let's uh, invite people, thousands, millions, to debate on the future of this continent. Let's come out with clear results. Let's invite the people of our continent to decide on membership of a new union uh, and uh, to say yes or no. I, I would think, I will come with the question in a second, I think this will shift us to a new quality of our union. And my question is, 
Would you be prepared to passionately share this approach? Thank you for your question. Next. Hello, Jasper Berging from the Netherlands. You have both spoken about economic growth a lot and um, about implicitly the importance of gross domestic product. Uh, gross domestic products and the economy are important, but they do not attach as much importance to environmental and social issues as they should. So my question to you is, would you like to consider alternative indicators um, in your role, future role as Commission President to Mr. Verhofstadt and in economic policy to Mr. Rain? In uh, Bhutan, they have an alternative indicator, gross national happiness. In November 2014, will we have gross European happiness? That's my question. <laughs> Thank you very much for your Thank question. You. And one final question from the floor from the gentleman behind you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Romsels, Vice President of Young European Federalists. I'm very happy to hear that both candidates want to campaign for a Europe that is big on big things, small on small things, and that takes the value of subsidiarity close to heart, because that's exactly what a federal Europe would be. Now, in order to get there, Mr. Wren already mentioned that a new convention might be in order. But my question is, what would both candidates suggest that they do in order to make sure that this convention would not be a failure like the last one turned out to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you for all your questions. Oh, we've one more there, very, very briefly. In this moment where I talk, there is a Belge in prison in Uganda for the simple fact of being homosexual. I think of the Europe of the rights of man. What does Europe do to defend the rights of man? en dehors de l'Europe. Il y a des gens en Malaisie et à Singapour qui sont torturés, qui reçoivent des coups de bâton du simple fait qu'ils sont des émigrés clandestins. C'est scandaleux et inadmissible et je trouve que l'Europe doit, doit prendre des sanctions contre ces pays-là. Okay. Je vous remercie. Merci bien. Thank you very much for your question on human rights, what Europe can do more about human rights outside Europe. OK. Ali, shall we start with you? Thank you. It's, uh, it's customary, so I can, I can start. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I start with uh, the questions uh, related to foreign policy. They were from uh, the gentlemen from uh, Finland uh, and Italy and uh, also from Belgium. All these uh, relate uh, to foreign policy. I believe that, uh, and that's uh, in fact uh, very much uh, reflected in the last comment uh, or question, the European Union has uh, during the, the economic crisis uh, been uh, much too focused uh, on its uh, internal issues. Uh, we have been looking too much uh, inwards uh, and uh, not uh, doing enough uh, in terms of uh, reflecting our formidable power of uh, transformation externally in our neighborhood uh, or defending uh, human rights uh, and democracy more broadly in the world. And I believe that uh, we have to certainly do better in this regard uh, during the next uh, parliamentary mandate uh, and I believe that uh, we are very much in agreement uh, on this uh, with uh, Guy. Concerning uh, the question of uh, TEPO, as regards uh, what kind of uh, reforms we would need uh, in the external action service and uh, in the making of uh, common foreign policy, common foreign and security policy, I believe that uh, we are currently underutilizing uh, our strengths uh, in a sense that uh, when we make a policy in relation to, say, China or in relation to Russia, we should have a, a stronger comprehensive strategy for Europe uh, combining trade policy, which currently is leading in an excellent way, combining uh, visa issues, uh, combining uh, political and uh, human rights issues. Uh, and, uh, for instance, uh, as we work with uh, Russia, it's important that uh, we could uh, get a stop uh, to the irritants uh, in uh, trade policy. Russia is uh, often harassing its uh, neighboring countries, uh, for instance, uh, the Baltic states uh, in uh, trade policy. Russia wants to have uh, a visa facilitation agreement, uh, so could we not uh, think uh, creatively in this regard uh, and uh, set uh, certain uh, incentives and conditions uh, for moving forward uh, in this regard? I could give you plenty of other examples, uh, but it's important that uh, the Vice President, uh, High Representative uh, responsible for foreign policy, utilizes um, all the community competencies uh, from climate and energy policy to trade policy and uh, 
together with uh, other commissioners, uh, works out uh, a workable, viable political strategy. We are underscoring on this uh, for the moment. Second, you ask uh, what, are, what are the successes. Uh, I believe that uh, we have had uh, a success uh, as regards uh, the breakthrough in the nuclear negotiations with Iran. And uh, I believe uh, Karel is doing an uh, excellent uh, job uh, as regards uh, preparing ground uh, for uh, a free trade agreement uh, with the United States. Uh, and in this, this regard, uh, I find it important that uh, we are taking some time for consultation as regards uh, the investment uh, protection agreement, uh, because there are perhaps legitimate concerns uh, on this uh, among our uh, population. There was a question on, uh, on uh, how to measure happiness uh, and uh, whether that should be part of uh, our, our work. Uh, in fact, uh, the work of the European Union, uh, to my mind, uh, is much broader than only, only economic issues. Uh, and uh, we have to work uh, for sustainable ecological development. Uh, we have to have uh, a strong social dimension in the Economic and Monetary Union. And uh, we have to work so that uh, we will uh, combine this uh, with our economic uh, objectives. And finally, on the question of uh, Matthias' uh, functional, functional, function and form, uh, I take your point, uh, and uh, I think uh, it is a very important uh, point uh, that uh, we, we have to try to certainly improve uh, the functioning of the European Union and uh, have a new perspectives in that regard. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, we have to learn the lessons of the negotiations of the Lisbon Treaty, which was uh, originally called uh, a constitutional treaty. We spent uh, one decade uh, on that uh, treaty, let's be honest, uh, and uh, the outcome was uh, perhaps uh, clearly Below, below the original expectations. So that's why I said uh, we have to first uh, think uh, what we really want uh, from uh, the possible convention and uh, then uh, decide uh, a very clear mandate for it uh, and then uh, not use uh, as much uh, time for this uh, convention to have uh, perhaps uh, a, a more targeted uh, change uh, of uh, how the European Union functions uh, than have uh, such a comprehensive approach which we tried uh, in the last decade uh, which uh, unfortunately did not uh, uh, live uh, up to the expectation. Thank you. Well, uh, maybe it's to start on the, on the international um, uh, items. I, I think that uh, the uh, European Union has uh, made some progress. Iran, for example, has been a success for the European diplomacy. But let's be honest, there are also uh, very um, big issue strategies worldwide where the U European Union has not done enough uh, to avoid them. And I think, uh, and I use this platform again uh, to, to talk about it, I think about the Syrian tragedy. I think that the attitude of the international community in the Syrian issue is not only of the European Union, is a shame. I cannot use another word than that. Because let's be honest about it. It was two years and a half that we have to intervene in Syria. At the moment of Homs, six months after the start of this uh, democratic uh, uh, revolution, who had the same nature as in Egypt, as in Libya, as in Tunisia. And now it's true, there are plenty of jihadists, and now nobody has the courage to intervene because of the jihadists, but the jihadists came there because the Western countries did nothing in that country in the beginning of uh, this uh, revolution. And I think that we have to prepare ourselves better uh, to the future of Syria, because a man like Assad, who is killing uh, 11,000 people in prison after torture, repatriating them with digital photos, that is what's happening for the moment. It's somebody who has to put before an international court for war crimes and not to be negotiated with around the table on the future of Syria. And my second point is again on the enlargement of the Union. The question has been put forward, the Balkans, okay, it's always better to put them inside the European family than to put uh, soldiers on the ground in the Balkans. But what about Turkey? Well, there is a problem with Turkey and we have to recognize it. The problem with Turkey is that they don't apply the criteria of Copenhagen more and more, more specific, the freedom of speech and the freedom of press in Turkey doesn't exist really longer. 
They are for the moment at the 115th rank in freedom of expression in Turkey. That is uh, more or less the same ranking as China. So I don't think that is really uh, what we need inside uh, the Union. So there is a problem. And then my third point, migration. The lack of a migration policy, Lampedusa, the question has been put forward. Well, I think we need a European migration policy, a, a legal European migration policy. And that is the best way to fight the illegal migration and the human trafficking we see today. Why is it not possible with Europe to develop a policy like the Canadians have, the Australians have, the Americans have with legal migration as the best part as the best way to counter illegal migration and human trafficking we see inside and outside the Mediterranean uh, Sea. On the convention, uh, dear friends, uh, I have uh, what that, but I'm not neutral about that because the declaration of Laken when I was prime minister was the launch of the convention. It got good points, there were also bad points, but it was in any way a new way of thinking about Europe, a new way to make a treaty, not in the rooms uh, uh, of a number of capitals in Europe, but in openness, in transparency. And so I think that we shall not avoid a convention again. Why? Because the British are there. They're asking. And not only Andrew Duff, more David Cameron, I have to tell you. They're asking for a new treaty. They're asking to withdraw from the European Union. We shall not avoid it. So better than to talk about their request, we can maybe talk uh, together about the future of the European uh, Union. So that is possible. And then, then finally, about uh, happiness, I'm a more or less a, a classic liberal. When you have a good money and a good gross domestic product, that's better to have happiness, I think, always, uh, than uh, instead of uh, the opposite. And then our last point about Italy, because that uh, was a little criticism uh, that uh, a little point that we have to rectify. We shall have a new list in Italy. I'm going tomorrow again to Rome to combine in total 15 political parties and movements. Okay, there's no lack of political movements in Italy. Eh? I can tell you <laughs> that. Eh? That's enough. Uh, uh, I can give you all the, uh, all the names. And we shall try also to put our party, Italia de Valori, inside. Because what is not possible, that should be a liberal group without Italians. That is impossible even for the future. Thank you. <laughs> so for the food, for the food and for the drinks. Thank you possible. all very much for your attention and thank you to both Ali Ren and Giver Hirsch. I wish, wish you both the best of luck. We've just got run out of time and you do only have one hour to vote. As I said before, you must go to foyer three. 148 votes will be cast this afternoon and 240 are currently being voted online. And the results will be read out here by Sir Graham Watson at six o'clock. So I wish you all a wonderful Saturday here in Brussels and thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye.